Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. How many of you folks have been, been able to get to, on vacation? Have been on vacation somewhere? Uh, Mandy and Blake? Yeah, great. How many folks are looking forward to vacation this summer, maybe? All right. I think there are times in our lives when it's important for us to hit the reset button. And vacation can help us do that. I hesitate to make this analogy, but I will anyway. In a sense, we're sort of like computers. We need to reboot on occasion. We need to unplug and just kind of rest there for a moment before we plug it back in and, and then let the computer fire up again. And when we do, we hope that we'll be running faster and smoother. There'll be less glitches in the computer. Maybe there'll be less viruses. Who knows? I don't know. That's why we take vacations. We want to refresh ourselves. We want to regenerate. We want to recalibrate. Whatever word you want to put there. We want to re, re-energize. Well, I don't know about you, but during vacation, I find myself difficult, it's very difficult for me to shut off my mind's computer for a while. It takes a few days, you know. Have you ever been on, like, the first, the first two couple days of vacation, you're kind of wandering around like a zombie, wondering, what, what am I supposed to be doing here? I'm out of my, I'm out of my element. But after a few days, maybe you begin to embrace your surroundings. You can finally relax and, and download, download that new app on your, on your phone that says vacation, and you feel like you're on vacation, maybe. I don't know. I'm no technology geek, I'll tell you that. My, my kids laugh at me every time I try to text or, or use my smartphone to take a photo. They just they think it's the funniest thing. But uh, sometimes it's... Sometimes it, Even if you turn off the computer and you turn it back on and it's still not working properly, at least you can say to yourself, I tried something, you know, I don't know what to do next. I think that's that's true about our faith sometimes. Here's another analogy. You're walking through the woods and eventually you get lost. Has that ever happened to you? That's happened to me on on a couple occasions. You don't know. What do you do? How do you get out of a mess like that? Well, typically what I do is try to backtrack hopefully backtrack, you know, maybe I should have thrown out some uh, crumbs of bread or something or to find my way back, but I don't think that'll work either. But how do we reorient ourselves? Again, go back to the beginning. This can happen to a person's walk with the Lord. We're walking along through life, just going about the business of life, taking care of life's responsibilities, doing good things for the church, doing good things for others, and then one day we, we realize that we've forgotten how we got there in the first place. What am I doing here? What is the, what is the purpose of me sitting in the pews? What is the purpose of me showing up at a, at a business meeting or being, you know, taking the position as a deacon or trustee? When this happens to us, we need to reboot. It's going back to the beginning. It's to regain, to really to regain our bearings, to remember why we're here in the first place. Did you know Genesis, the word Genesis actually means the beginning? In the beginning? It is the first phrase of the Hebrew text, and as as custom goes, they usually title the book based on the first phrase couple words of the text. The English title Genesis is of the Greek origin and comes from the word Genesis, which appears in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which has got a, a fancy word called a Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, depending on its context, the word means birth or genealogy or history of origin. So the title of Genesis is appropriate for the first book of the Bible, since really the first book of the Bible is primarily about the beginnings. Not just the beginning of the Bible, beginning of our world, of God's creation. Lately, there's been a big push in our society to know one's genealogy. 
Remember the different uh, Ancestry.com? Maybe you've been on that website. How about 23andMe? There's, because there's like 23 chrome, you get 23 chromosomes from your parent, from uh, each parent, right? Is that right? Yeah, I think you're right. I, I, I took biology a long time ago. But uh, what, why, is that? why is there such a big push? Why do people want to go back and find out their genealogy? You know, what, am, I, am I German? Am I Irish? Do I have any Asian in me? Well, perhaps it has something to do with the prevailing thought that the more you know about you, the more you're confident about your future, where you're going. And, and when you think about it, people are always looking, in ed, looking for an edge to understand the future. You know, I mean, for example, you remember in, in uh, Back to the Future 2 when uh, Marty and Biff, they are fighting over that, the sports almanac that's from the future, and if they get that thing, then they could, you know, place all the bets that, and win all the money, right? And become rich and rich. But John, the, the, John says something in his gospel about the Lord and about about the Lord's understanding of who he is at such, a, at such a depth, at such a level, that it helps him accomplish his mission. Jesus knew, it says that, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. John writes, you see, because Jesus was absolutely certain about his identity, he was fully able to embrace the mission God had sent him, his Father had sent him on, offering himself as a perfect sacrifice for the sins of humanity. For Jesus, his mission is so important that there could be no doubts about something so monumental, so earth-shattering, considering what Jesus was about to do. He was to offer his life as a ransom for many. Sometimes I think... We all at one time or another in our lives have this urge to start over, to wipe the slate clean, so to speak. It's probably not a rare or foreign feeling for us. And maybe it's quite common. You probably have all felt it. Maybe it's, I know it happens to me every spring. I had this desire to start moving furniture around my room and start cleaning up the house. And that's that spring cleaning urge the desire to start a new project, a career, uh, maybe a new home, a new life. The interesting thing is God felt that once, at least once. You see, only after a few generations, God saw, he looked over humanity after he had made it. Just by speaking, he, made, he, brought, he brought creation into being. And just after a few generations of humanity, he looked out there and he was quite distraught and dis disappointed with what mankind had become. And he said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the earth. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air. I am grieved that I have made man. What a, a shocking, a shocking statement by a loving God. That's from Genesis chapter 6. So God decided to, to, to reboot, in a sense, to start creation over again, at least partially. Why? Because things were getting out of hand. Well, not from God's perspective. Nothing gets out of God's hand. God's always in perfect control. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. Nothing hap no, not a sparrow from the sky drops without, without him knowing it. He knows the number of hairs on our head. From, so from God's perspective, nothing was out of control, but from man's perspective, everything was out of control. The world was on a one-way track toward self-destruction, and God in his righteousness and mercy just expedited the inevitable. He says, man, are just, they're just destroying each other. But maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves for a second. The point in all this is that we need to know our beginnings. We need to know our origins so that when we come to that crossroads in life, and let's face it, we're all going to come to those crossroads in our lives, and we're going to ask those very important, deep philosophical questions like, what is life all about? 
What is the purpose of my life? What is life's meaning? And when this happens, we don't want to be left holding an empty bag, staring into the darkness. Instead, we, we hear the words of Paul in Acts 17, and he says, The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needs anything because he himself gives all men life and breath, and he includes and everything else. But sadly, hopelessness, it pervades, it, it can pervade our lives, especially, especially if we do not know the, the Lord of heaven and earth. So many people today, in this day and age, are hopeless. If you don't believe me, all you have to do is peruse the news articles or watch news for a while, and you, you hear about people who have lost all hope and purpose in life. And then they do then they're out there doing unmentionable things. One story I read, it's a while back now, but a young lady was so distraught over her, uh, her college research project that she decided she was going to deep plane at 4,000 feet. Because she couldn't, life became unbearable for her. And it was about a research, a college research project. Most of the reports usually say something about a person's inability to cope with stress. And it, whether it's a shooting in Texas or Buffalo, New York, or wherever, they always talk about, well, that person, you know, was mentally deranged or could not cope with life or something like that. And I'm sure that's true. But the question is, what is the root cause of the stress in the first place? That's what you've got to get to. It's not enough to just... You know, come up with a diagnosis and say, well, this is what was wrong. What is, the, what is the cure? I think it's undeniably tied to the fact that many who find themselves in such desperate situations have yet to accept the basic and fundamental and foundational truth found in the Scripture that we, first of all, are the creation of God. And the only reason that we exist on this planet called Earth is because God willed it to be so. Let's go back to Genesis, or excuse me, Acts 17 again, where Paul writes this. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And, deter and he determined the time set for them. And get this, you probably didn't and the exact places where they should live. So before you ever came to Elmont, before we came to Elmont, God knew in his plan that there was a time we were going to be here. Did you know, uh, this is a stunning, a stunning revelation I found out. I found out that my old church secretary from Montana lived in Elmont. I, can you believe that? She only lived for like six months, but her folks are from Michigan, and somehow, you know, she ended up at Elbot many years ago, I should say, but that was my church secretary in Montana. Um, unbelievable. I was, I was shocked when I heard that. But going back to Paul in Acts 17, he has set for them the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men, why? Here's why. God would seek him, perhaps reach out for him and find him and it says though he is not far from any one of us yes even in the little village of Elmont God is here waiting for us and that is the first major point that in, in the word of God that we are God's creation in the very first sentence of the Bible, we are immediately introduced to God, maker of heaven and earth. There's no debate. There's no speculation. There's no dueling theories about the origin of the universe. It is a given. The universe exists because God created it. And we are here because God created us. In the matter of two phrases, Moses teaches us that the real, there is a real relationship to be had between God and man. 
creator and the created. Isaiah says something similar. He writes, this is what the Lord says. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens and who spread out the earth all by myself. And when you think about that phrase, heaven and earth, really what that boils down to the idea, I made everything up from the top to the bottom and everything in between, God made it all. That's what the heaven, heavens and earth mean. By the way, who taught Moses this truth? Did, did Moses have some teacher? Well, God himself. Who told Moses that God Almighty was the maker of heaven and earth? Moses is credited with writing the first five books of the Bible, and his personal story doesn't even enter into the Bible until Exodus, when the Hebrew nation is already 400 years old. They've been in slavery in Egypt. So he obviously wasn't around at the time of creation, and yet Moses speaks about God's creation. There was an archbishop of Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul, back in the 4th century, and he addresses the, the, the unique situation of Moses. He says this, While all other inspired authors told either what would happen over a long time or what was going to take place immediately, this author, being born many generations after the event, speaking of the creation event, he was guided by deity on high and judged worthy of, to narrate what had been created by the Lord of all from the very beginning. And he continues... He well nigh bellows at us all and says, Is it by human beings I am taught in uttering these things? It is the one who brought being from nothing. That's called ex nihilo. Out of nothing, God created. And it stirred Moses' tongue in narrating this so that we might know the truth. 800 years ago, these words were, excuse me, 1,800 years ago. And, and this archbishop of Constantinople, um, his words are true for us today. They are practical and timely for us today. The Old Testament is filled with, well, I could say God's truth, but it's more than, I mean, it is God's truth, it's the truth that we need to hear. And I'm not just calling out the secular humanists who, who always are coming up with a new theory of, of the origin of the universe apart from the creator, but even, you know, I'm, I'm calling out the churches who only will focus on, on the New Testament. There's so much truth that we need to hear from the Old Testament. What was Jesus referring to in Matthew 29 when he responded to the Pharisees who questioned divorce? He says, haven't you read from the very beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You know the craziness that's going on in our society today, that people can't even speak out in public about who, who, what is a male, what is a female, who can, who can be pregnant and who cannot, and all this craziness. It's, it just, it's, in, it's insanity. But when Jesus said that, he was referring to the scriptures way back in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And what about the two the disciples who are walking on the road to Emmaus and they, they are eventually, Jesus comes alongside them and they don't recognize him right away. But, they, but, <clears throat> but later on as they break bread together and um, Jesus speaks, speaks to them and teaches them everything that must be fulfilled that was written about them through the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. This is all Old Testament truth. And when that happened, their minds were opened and they could understand. It says they could understand the scriptures, yes, but more than that, they understood the realities of life. And I don't know about you, but as we we interact with people who are far from reading the Bible, we see that their reality is oftentimes is not a good one. 
Even Paul in the second letter to Timothy reminds us that all Scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching and rebuking and, and correcting and training in righteousness. Now, when he wrote that, all the Scripture wasn't even complete yet. So a lot of what he was speaking about when he said all of Scripture, he's talking about the Old Testament. One preacher put it this way, when did it become fashionable to pull the drain plug on our pool of knowledge in order to elevate our spirituality? We need, we need all of God's truth. Has there ever been a time in history of the world when the basic principles of the Bible need to be restored to the forefront of our, of our minds and our hearts? It, it, it's, it's right now. And it starts right at the beginning of the Bible when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And secondly, the idea that the Spirit of, of God was hovering over the waters. If the first sentence teaches about who is responsible for creation, about who is the first cause behind all the causes, the next line there, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, it it gives us a glimpse of the process of his creating, but even more than that, it gives us his quality of creation, his desire for creation. The hovering over, it's that little phrase, the hovering over the waters, it's used in only two other places in those scriptures. And when it talks about hovering, it's usually talking about a mother or a, a mother bird hovering over her nest of fledglings. The mother bird taking care and nurturing its young. These are, the, uh, these are analogous of God's care and protection and provision poured out upon his people, you and me. So here's the point in all this. Even as we see God lovingly and powerfully create, we already begin to detect God's intention for his creation. His purpose it, its more than just creating, it's to save and to rescue and to nurture and to provide a way for his creation from the very beginning. Just like the mother bird hovers over the nest caring for the little ones inside even as we see god engaging in transforming a formless and dark and empty environment that when we think about that that is beyond our creation our comprehension to think about god creating out of nothing but even as god creates from from the chaos that is the, the beginning there. We see it, you know, though. Even in that, he is creating and he's gathering. He's separating. He's f filling. And when he's doing that, his thoughts are upon his future children, his future creation, you and me. Though we are not even yet created when he's hovering over the waters, he, we become the pinnacle of creation in the eyes of God already. God in the form of the Holy Spirit. He hovers over the waters. And the water, as again, you know, the waters is another way to speak of the formlessness, the chaos. And as he's doing that, he imagines and he contemplates and he plans for his children's future just like, just like an expectant mother would, would sit down and begin knitting or crocheting a little stocking cap or a sweater for their, their expectant newborn child. God fully understands that his children, even from the very beginning, is going to need rescuing. They're going to need saving. Even as a parent, a human parent, knows that there's going to be joy and heartache and pain in raising offspring. Okay, I, you know, I got five kids. I can, I can say that I'm, you know, somewhat experienced in that area. But I've seen the joy, and I've experienced the heartache and the pain but we, God plunges forward in his creation, even though it's going to cost him dearly.
He plunges forward because God is love, it says, and love needs to be shared. So the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, they decree right there at the beginning, let there be light. And, there, and yes, was that light? Light, yes, light to illumine the world with the, the sun and the moon and the stars. But also, as you talked about, in, as, as Logan led us off today, the light that gives life to every man, Jesus the light shines in the darkness. The darkness, it says, has not understood it. Or another, another version says, has not overcome it. There are times when we need to reboot, to regain perspective, to be reminded about what life is all about. We need to be reminded about the one who made us and to reflect again upon his purpose for our lives, his intention for mankind in general, to bring honor and glory and praise to him who is forever to be praised. The Holy Spirit hovered over the waters, the waters of the deep, and in that moment when he did that, you and me, you and I, came to God's mind. God saw our birth. God saw our first step we took, our first loose tooth, our first skin knee, our, all those other firsts, including our first sin and rebelliousness against him. Our complete and utter refusal to obey him, and yet God said, let there be light. Let there be let there be a creation 